Okay, well, it's 530. So aloha, everyone, and welcome to a special presentation hosted by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council on Growing Up Fast, a land-based nursery for Hawaii's coral reefs. We are all very excited that you are here. I'm Darla Palmer Ellingson, your MC. And I'm also the local radio show producer and host of the public affairs program, Island Environment 360, Maui's only commercially broadcast public affairs show on environmental and related Hawaiian cultural topics. And that's aired on all the stations of H Hawaii Media. Tonight's presentation is part of Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's monthly Know Your Ocean Speaker Series. And it's usually held on the first Wednesday of each month at 5.30 via Zoom. But this month we have gravitated a little closer to Earth Day. And because we are celebrating Earth Day this week, we wanted to take a minute to acknowledge this special day. The first Earth Day was held in 1970 and organized by Senator Gaylord Nelson. 20 million Americans demonstrated in different US cities and it worked. The, in December 1970, Congress authorized the creation of a new federal agency to tackle environmental issues, the US Environmental Protection Agency. What followed was the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and other laws to protect our environment. Tonight, we're acknowledging the role of innovative solutions that are being developed to protect our ocean planet. To those of you who are innovators, as well as all of you who are activists, teachers, supporters, and volunteers in the work to protect our fragile planet, we salute you. And we hope you enjoy this poem by Amanda Gorman, the U.S. Youth Poet Laureate. This monthly series is supported by the County of Maui Mayor's Office of Economic Development. A few things before we get going. You'll notice your microphone is on mute. Please keep it on mute during the presentation to avoid distractions. And uh, we do invite you to submit questions as we go along by using the questions button on the lower edge of your screen. Sometimes you have to move your mouse over that lower part of the Zoom screen to see it. And we'll leave time at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter, Christina Jane. For the past two years, Christina has worked for the Department of Land and Natural Resources Division in the Aquatic Resources as a Coral Restoration Specialist at the Hawaii Coral Restoration Nursery on Oahu with Director David Gulko. Before moving to Honolulu, she earned her Bachelor's in Marine Biology from the University of California, San Diego, and her Master's from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Oceanography at UC San Diego. So please join me in welcoming Christina Jane. Welcome, Christina. Um, aloha, everyone. Thank you sure. so much, Darla. There you are. <laughs> yes. <Great. laughs> Clicked the wrong button. That's OK. I thought I was by myself there for a minute. So, <laughs> Christina, I'm just going to go ahead and turn things over to you then for your presentation. Great. Let's get started. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And Darla, please let me know if there's, I can't see it. Looks good. OK. Looks good. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Darla and um, everyone else for joining us tonight. I'm really excited to share about what the state is doing for Hawaii's coral reefs. Um, so as Darla said before, we're going to be talking about a land-based coral nursery for restoring Hawaii's reefs. Um, so let's just get right into it. So the first thing that I want to talk about is um, before we get into what is a coral nursery, but why do you need a coral nursery? Um, so Hawaii is, is very unique in its reefs and we'll get into that in a minute, but um, what the state uh, uh, decided why we needed a coral nursery is it's driven by the absence of mitigation for reef damages. 
Um, so when we think about reef damages, these can be events such as ship groundings. Um, they can be um, events such as the molasses spill in Honolulu Harbor. So that's the picture on the right. You can see all that really uh, dirty water there in the harbor. Um, on the left is a picture of the USS Port Royal, which is a Navy ship that ran aground um, on the south shore of Oahu uh, a long time ago in 2009. And uh, these events, you can actually still see the damage on the reef left, even though it's been over a decade, for example, for the Port Royal. Um, these also include planned events. So the ship groundings and molasses spill, those are examples of unplanned events, but there also is planned events such as a waterfront construction. So here uh, in Honolulu Harbor, they're building a new container terminal and so uh, they need to do waterfront construction for that area. And so uh, they need to mitigate for those planned damages to coral and aquatic life in, uh, in the area they're doing construction. Um, and in case anyone is unfamiliar with the term mitigation, it's uh, kind of like uh, making up for, for a, a damage. So if you think about when, if you think about how if a developer comes in and cuts down a bunch of trees or develops a natural area to build a bunch of houses and to mitigate for that damage to the trees, to that forest or that wetland, um, they go plant a bunch of trees somewhere else or they do something else to kind of try and make up for those damages. So that's kind of what mitigation means. And that's a little bit of uh, the part of the process that we're involved in, um, but with coral. All right, so, uh, so next I wanna talk about why coral reefs are important, especially Hawaii's coral reefs. Um, so coral reefs in general, are, uh, they're a type of ecosystem. So think of a tropical rainforest as an ecosystem. A coral reef is actually pretty similar. Um, so the, the coral is the foundation, it's kind of like the trees. Coral is the foundation for this ecosystem. And um, with because the coral is growing there, it's a, a home to many different organisms. So it really provides for high biodiversity. You have a lot of fish, you have a lot of um, creatures that live in coral reefs. Um, it's also provide, they provide a food source. So fishing um, without the coral reefs, you don't have the same fish, uh, especially here in Hawaii, tourism is a really big um, value for coral reefs. And uh, also in Hawaii, storm protection. So if you go out to the beach and you see all the waves breaking far out and they're not breaking on shore, that's because they're breaking out on the coral reef. And so that's helping prevent the shoreline erosion because um, they're breaking out there instead of on the shore and helps with erosion and protection from wave action and storms. And then also just coral reefs um, uh, provide a lot of research opportunities um, including medicines and other research that we can, um, there's just, there's a lot going on for coral reefs. So all of these things are, can be referred to as ecosystem services and functions. So this essentially just means um, what are the corals providing for, for us, for uh, as we have live on the land. And so actually you can put a dollar value on this amount and um, NOAA estimates that just Hawaii's coral reefs are um, worth about $36 billion a year. Um, sorry, Darla, I am trying to click and it is, it is not um, moving forward, hold on. Mm. Okay. Oh, there we go, okay. I don't know, I just needed. To click sticky, a little harder. <laughs> sticky keys. <laughs> um, so Hawaii's reefs alone are estimated to be worth about $36 billion uh, annually. Um, and so this slide has a lot of text on it. Don't worry, you don't have to read it. Uh, but this basically just emphasizes that corals are a very heavily fully protected in Hawaii, unlike many other places. Um, you can't take coral, you can't damage coral. Um, you can't possess coral unless you have a special permit. 
Uh, so coral and live rock is very uh, fully protected in Hawaii. All right, so now we're gonna dig into what is a coral nursery. So this picture actually that I have as the background here is a coral nursery um, in the Caribbean, I believe this is in, this is Coral Restoration Foundation, this is in Florida. Um, and so a coral nursery is essentially a farm or a way to farm corals, often through the use of fragmentation. So um, corals are colonial organisms. So if you have a coral and you break it in half, you now have two corals. Um, and so these corals are grown in these nurseries are meant to be outplanted back onto degraded reef areas. So this picture is of an in-water nursery uh, that's a common in the Caribbean, Florida, South Pacific, uh, where they're growing these branching corals on what are called coral trees. So they're kind of suspended in the water column. Um, so in water, a little bit more about in water nurseries, you can see in the background of this picture that's PVC and the corals hang off each of those branches, hence the tree. So in water nurseries work really well in other parts of the world. Um, they're really low cost and you can put out a lot of small pieces of coral. Um, those are uh, disadvantages in terms of the size of coral you can only put out smaller colonies. Um, you also need, you need this fast growing branching species. And uh, you also have the issue of gravity kind of, since your corals are just hanging, they grow in a little bit uh, kind of weird, weird shapes. Um, and uh, so you, for an in-water nursery, you require to have fast growing species. So fast growing species would be something that grows about 15 to 20 centimeters a year. Um, and we'll get into in a minute of how fast Hawaii species grow, but species uh, in the Great Barrier Reef can actually grow up to 20 to 25 centimeters a year. So you also need uh, pretty calm water for these trees. You know, you don't, you can't have big waves coming in and ripping up your trees. Um, and you also need a low, uh, low nutrient environment. Um, and so using this method in water nurseries are able to produce thousands and thousands of small coral colonies that they could outplant back onto the reef. So I wanna talk about as in the title of this talk is land-based nursery. So we're gonna get into why do we have a land-based nursery and why not an in-water nursery? Um, so here in Hawaii, I mean, Hawaii is unique in itself but our corals are also uh, very unique. So Hawaiian corals grow very, very slowly. So about one to two centimeters a year on average. And uh, those corals in Florida, they go about 10 to 15 centimeters a year. Um, and there, we don't have the same species that occur elsewhere. So most reefs in the world are actually dominated by this fast growing branching species called Acropora. And we don't have that here in the main Hawaiian islands. Um, and another thing is a lot of our reefs are very close to shore um, and they're basically right up against the shore. And so they're also vulnerable to um, a lot of, anything that happens on land basically is gonna affect your reef down the stream. So if you have uh, sedimentation, pollution, um, just usage, it's all right up against what are often heavily urbanized areas. So what we did at our nursery actually is we tried to do some hanging corals and just to see what would happen. We, we did this in the tank, um, in a big uh, tank outside and we tried it and you can see that the corals um, grew, they grew really slowly, but they, they grew, but they grew in these really weird shapes that um, were kind of fragile and we couldn't really uh, use them for outplanting. So we did try it before we settled on our current method of growing Hawaiian corals. So most Hawaiian corals look like this. They look like a big old boulder. Um, and these are actually called boulder or massive corals, this growth form of coral. So instead of having those um, branching corals, we have these big massive colonies. And so both functionally um, and ecologically, these corals are very different from branching corals. So these corals are very slow growing, um, but if you think about it, it's a 
big boulder, right? Um, and that boulder is growing. And so it really contributes to the foundation of the reef, um, the structure of the reef and the durability. So if you imagine a big wave coming and crashing into one of these corals, it's not, um, it's able to stand up to that wave action. Um, and also what we noted about Hawaiian corals is that because of the growth form of these corals, the larger the colony, the better um, survival they have. And also there's this concept called size refuge. And what that means is that once, uh, it doesn't have to be a coral, once an organism gets to a certain size, it doesn't have to devote all of its energy into growth and it can devote um, start devoting some of that energy to reproduction. So it's not worried about trying to grow as fast as possible. It's, it's reached a, a size where it can um, contribute to reproduction instead. Um, so those are the corals that we focus on at our nursery. Our nursery is on the island of Oahu and we are located at Anuinui Fisheries Research Center, which is out on Sand Island. Um, and our nursery is, uh, was formed due to the recognized need that the state had for a unique uh, facility to mitigate for these damages that we talked about earlier. And we needed to uh, grow corals in a controlled environment as we talked about how Hawaiian corals are unique and we can't use the same techniques used elsewhere in the world. We had to come up with something new. And I just like to point out that that picture in the lower right corner is our beautiful view that we see every day um, of downtown Honolulu from across the harbor. Hey, Christina, do you mind if I ask you real quick, you, you just covered the types of corals that you're focusing mm -hmm. on and you, you might answer this coming up, but are you also working on uh, growing any rare Hawaiian corals? Uh, yes, that's jumping ahead to the oh, last I'm portion sorry. of my talk. <laughs> well, well, I can um, wait. I can wait. <laughs> no, it's okay. We we are working on um, growing. I'm actually the lead for our uh, rare coral arc, where we are growing rare corals. Since Hawaii has such high rates of endemism, um, rare corals and corals that only grow in Hawaii are really important, and that's definitely part of our nursery. Okay, we had somebody uh, in the audience asking about other types of corals, so we'll we'll get more details later. Yes, thank you for, uh, that's a good question though. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so the overall goal of our nursery is to um, take small pieces of coral from non-reef areas and grow them to large sizes. So we say, 10 to 15 centimeters of coral to start out with. And we want to grow that to a 42 centimeter coral in one year. And in the wild, this would take about 20 to 25 years, um, but we're able to do it in one year. And we're kind of gonna walk through that process of how we're able to do that. So uh, these are all the steps for what a coral grows through at our nursery. So first we collect the coral, we quarantine uh, the coral, make sure to get rid of pests and other health issues. Then there's fragmentation and growing of the coral, acclimating the coral back to more natural conditions, and finally outplanting and uh, monitoring. So we're gonna talk about each of these steps. So for coral collection, I mentioned that we try and collect from non-reef areas. So, um, this is a bunch of our staff in a harbor. It's great water. <laughs> and we target harbor corals because of their lower services and functional value. So remember what we talked about before is how corals on a reef are providing all these ecosystem services for us, but a coral growing on a piling in a harbor isn't providing those same services. So essentially when you, um, put a value on the coral, that coral is worth less. It's not helping with storm protection. It's not really providing fish habitat. Um, so it's essentially worth uh, less in that environment than on a natural reef. So we target those corals to grow at our nursery, um, but not all coral species will grow in harbors. Um, harbor water quality is definitely not pristine. And so what we do is if we need to have species that don't occur in a harbor, and we need to take from a natural reef, we actually mitigate for our own take. So what we do is 
we um, collect a little bit larger piece of that coral and we grow two large corals from that piece. One of those corals goes back to its original site that we collected it from. And one of those corals goes to our restoration site. So we make sure that um, even if we have to take from natural reefs that we are actually adding back to that reef in the end. And finally, um, because the state of Hawaii is a natural resource trustee, we make sure to track all of our corals, every single coral that comes to the nursery, we photograph and document all of our collections and every step as it goes through the nursery, finally to outplanting. So when we get the coral, we've collected the coral from our harbor, we bring it back to the nursery and there's a few things that we do. So first, um, since harbors are a hot spot for alien invasive species, um, we want to make sure that we remove any of those. We don't wanna be spreading those around as we um, process and outplant our coral. Um, we remove pests. This is a picture of some Montepore eating flatworms. And we also remove any excess rock or other things that the coral is growing on. Um, and sometimes that is just with a hammer and chisel. So what we want to do is get just the coral. Um, we don't want any sponges or algae or anything else with it. We want just the coral sitting on just enough rock that it needs to. Um, and then that goes into our quarantine systems. So we have a bunch of these tanks outside that are our dedicated quarantine tanks. And these are what's called open systems. So we have water, from that we pull from the harbor, we filter it and it goes into these tanks and then it drains out back to the harbor. So what we do with these tanks is we bring the coral, we clean it up, we put it in here and we hold it in quarantine for a minimum of one month. So 30 days and we look for those pests, we look for invasive species, we look for health. It has to be healthy for the full 30 days. If we find a pest or something on day 29 then that cycle starts all over again. And um, uh, so I mentioned that the water goes back to the harbor. And so because these corals might have pests or invasive species on them, we actually have all of our outgoing drain water go through a UVC sterilizer. So that zaps anything. Um, and we, so we return our water to the harbor cleaner than how we got it. And this is also the first step of where corals receive their ID tag so that we can keep track of the coral throughout every step at the nursery. Okay, so this is the exciting part. This is how we get corals to grow faster. This is how we do um, the 20 to 25 years of growth in one year. So we use a technique called microfragmentation. And so what we do is we have our original colony here, as you can see on the left, and we cut it up basically into a bunch of small, about one centimeter square pieces. And we secure them onto this concrete pyramid, which is called a module. So we call it our coral modules. And eventually then that coral, all those pieces will grow, fuse back together and form this one large coral that then gets outplanted out onto the reef. So we do that, we cut the coral using this um, saltwater bandsaw, which is actually from the uh, aquarium hobbyist trade. So people on the mainland who keep coral in their aquariums use these saws to cut their coral and it won't hurt your finger. It only cuts right through coral. Um, so we cut the coral into these small pieces, piece, pieces, depending on what species it is. So some species we can cut smaller and some species we need to cut a little bigger. Um, and here's more, a few more pictures of cutting the coral with the bandsaw. And then we secure those, all those little micro fragments onto the coral module using surgical grade super glue gel. Um, so how does micro fragmentation make the coral grow faster? So you can see on the picture, you can on the right, um, there's all these, you can see the original kind of square shape of these fragments and how they have grown down and they've started to fuse back together. So that's exactly what we wanna see on our modules is if you think about it, a big coral can only grow on the edges of the coral. So it can only grow on the very edges. The middle of the coral is still alive, it's still living, but it, it can't grow there. So by cutting it up into a bunch of small pieces, we increase that surface area to volume ratio. 
So it's able to grow on all those edge areas from each of those little pieces. And all these frags are from the same mother colony. So they're all genetically identical. So they're all clones. So when they grow and they touch their neighbor, um, they recognize it as self and they'll fuse back together. And then also you'll notice that these pieces, there's no scale in this photograph, but these pieces are really thin. Um, they're kind of almost like little chips. And so we're able to cut off uh, the majority of the skeleton. What we want is we want the tissue layer on top and we want the thin layer of skeleton on the bottom. So we don't need the rest of the skeleton. Um, and since these corals have often been growing in harbors, corals actually incorporate things into their skeleton as they grow. And so we don't want to have um, heavy metals or other things that they may have incorporated into that old, old skeleton. We want that skeleton that's only a few years old. And then finally, we uh, have that mother colony that we cut up and we actually save a little bit, a little piece of it, um, which we call our source material. Uh, in case, say one of these frags doesn't make it and it dies, but everything else around it is fine. Now all those other pieces have to grow a little bit more to fill in that space. So what we do is we can just cut a small piece from our leftover source material, put it back in that spot, and we can maintain that same growth rate for our modules. Okay, so how do we make our coral modules? Um, they are made out of concrete. So Portland type two cement, and we make them into this 42 centimeter diameter pyramid shape. So this is um, essentially a plastic sheets, thick plastic sheets that are upside down in essentially a sandbox. And we'll pour the concrete, we mix our concrete ourselves, we pour it in there, and that is what gives us this pyramid shape. And so we, the important thing is, is that concrete after it's first been casted can be really caustic and has a lot of things that can leach out of it. And so we don't wanna put our coral directly on that concrete. What we do is we cure our modules. And so we soak them in fresh water for two weeks. We change the fresh water out and so that all that nasty stuff is able to be leached out of the concrete. And then we take it out after two weeks and um, we just let it sun dry. And then it's ready for corals. So once we glue corals onto our modules, they need to grow in our grow out system. So we have kind of two things that are helping the coral grow faster. Our first is microfragmentation, but then to keep those microfragments alive, we keep them in specialized aquarium systems. We basically just large aquariums that are optimized for coral growth. Um, so we have essentially a five-star hotel for our corals. We want them to be um, as healthy and grow fast as possible. So we, um, we pull our water from the harbor, but it goes through extensive filtration. So this is the cleanest water. They're getting specialized um, lighting. So we use LED lights that are uh, used in the coral aquarium trade and to give the, the best wavelength, best intensity of light. And we also uh, do, we basically just take care of the corals as best as possible so they can grow as fast as possible. So this is a picture of one of our systems on the, these are actually two pictures, but on the left, you can see there are a bunch of modules in our tanks. And these modules have been uh, fragged pretty recently or the corals, you can see all the little dots on there. Those are all the micro frags. And then on the right, you can see some of the setup that we use in order to keep these corals alive and to keep them growing as fast as possible. So not only do we provide the ideal lighting, the ideal uh, water parameters and um, care, we also do a few other things to enhance the coral growth. So corals have symbiotic algae that lives inside their tissues. And so the lighting helps feed the algae, which helps feed the coral. But corals also have little tentacles and they can grab food out of the water column and also supplement their energy that way. So we feed our corals three times a week. We culture live food. And we also have a custom mix of frozen foods, which is like different types of frozen fish foods. We did um, just internal research to figure out what gave us the fastest, best growth rate. And we also add minerals to the water. So like such as calcium. So corals need calcium to grow their skeleton. And actually, if 
because our, our corals are in essentially big aquariums, as they use that calcium, it gets depleted in the water. So we have to replace that calcium and add even more calcium so they can grow that skeleton um, eat faster. Okay, and then once our corals are in their five-star hotel, they get uh, room service and eventually all of those little microfragments will grow and fuse back together. So this picture shows uh, the, a close-up of some of one of our coral modules and you can see that there are those bumps. So those are where the original fragments were and you can see that they've grown, they have fused back together and there's no lines or anything. It's because they're all the same genotype. So they're all clones. So they recognized themselves and they fuse together to form one large colony. So once it's gotten to this point, then we can get it ready to go back out into the reef. So here are some of our fully covered modules in one of our acclimation tanks. So our corals are in this five-star hotel and they've grown great and they're fully covered for the entire concrete module. But we can't just toss them back out into the ocean. It'd be a little bit of a shock for them. So what we do is we um, acclimate our corals. So you can see there's a picture on the right of um, one of my fellow coral specialists, Chelsea Wilkie, and she's holding a coral module in one of our acclimation tanks. And what we need to do is we need to get them acclimated back to more natural conditions. So they've been under artificial lighting, they've been fed, they've gotten the best water quality. So we need to acclimate them back to more realistic conditions. We can't kick them out of the house like suddenly. We need to slowly, <laughs> slowly convince them to move out. Um, and so outside, we're able to acclimate them to more natural lighting conditions. We're able to, um, Actually, in the back of this photo, there's a big thing and a big black thing in the back that looks like a barrel. And it is a barrel, actually, but it's been modified um, to be a surge device. And so that creates fake waves or artificial waves for our coral. So they get used to more wave action. And the water that's going into this tank is filtered, but it's not as filtered as it was in our grow out rooms. And so we're able to acclimate to whatever outplant site that we plan to put them. So if we say they're going to a shallower site, then we acclimate them to higher light levels um, that match that of the site. Or if they're going to a slightly deeper site, then we can still acclimate to light, less, in less intense light levels. And they're in acclimation for at least one month. Okay, and then the exciting part, well, it's all exciting, but outplanting I think is exciting. It's kind of like you've watched your child grow up and now they're going out into the world. Um, so what we do for outplanting is we have, it's quite a process. We need to uh, survey our site, select where it's gonna go, uh, do our actual outplanting, and then document and monitor all of our corals. So, on the picture on the left, this is for this was for a smaller outplanting where we just transported our corals actually with a boogie board um, tried to a bread tray. It works great actually. Um, and we're able to move the corals because they're pretty heavy. They're big and they're on concrete. And then we're able to select the site, clean the site, outplant them. So that's actually this middle picture here is from Monday. So this week, um, we've been doing more field work and we were able to outplant some corals Monday and Tuesday. Uh, and so, and then on the right is myself and another coral specialist, Norton Chan. And this was from um, 2019. We were outplanting some more corals off the boat. So um, this is our pilot site. When we first started, this is at Sand Island Beach Park. So just two minute drive from the coral nursery. And we outplanted nine modules here as our proof of concept to see, okay, look, how are they gonna do, um, how will this work? So you can see that the module, uh, actually I'll, I'll call your attention to the modules in the back first. So you can see that they look like pyramids, they look a pyramid shape, but the one in the front doesn't look so much like a pyramid anymore. So that one in the front was outplanted earlier than the other ones in the back. 
And you can see that it's done really well and it's starting to grow. Uh, it's gotten more lumpy. It started to grow down onto the surrounding reef substrate. And it's just taken on a more natural growth form. Mm -hmm. Hey, Christina, would you mind if I ask you a question while we're still looking at these um, concrete modules? Of course, go ahead. Uh, Mark Dikos asked, has growth on washed versus unwashed concrete modules been quantified? Uh, he says he's curious to know how much the non-leach chemicals impede growth since most large coral translocation projects attach corals directly into wet concrete mix? Yes, so most of those, um, well, most of the ones that, that I know of where they've transplanted corals is often using the fast growing corals. And I know that the coral at the bottom where it's stuck in the concrete has died. Mm. But I think that if you plant enough corals, uh, I, I, I think that they're just kind of hoping that those are faster growing corals and that some of them will, will survive. Mm. Um, I haven't done that myself and I don't, I don't know if anyone in, in Hawaii has, but I'm not sure. But um, for us, we've actually taken uh, modules that were not fully cured yet and put them in a, in a tank and just tested the water and just see what would happen. We actually tested the fresh water too. And the, the pH is crazy high. Um, it just leaches all this stuff into the water and actually makes it really alkaline. Hmm. Um, and so in the ocean, if you do that in the field, you know, you, you probably get more, a much more localized effect. It's probably where the concrete and the coral meet is where you're going to have that mortality. Um, but you kind of have a, a bigger body of water to dilute that effect. But I think if you did enough, then you might um, affect the coral that would be touching the concrete. So yeah, we, we are very careful and we don't put coral and wet concrete together. We don't even put coral and dry concrete together. We make sure that it's cured and anything uh, that can negatively affect the coral is eliminated, yeah, or reduced as much as possible. Okay, thank you for letting me in interject that question. Oh yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so this is our, our pilot site and the, actually the next slide is really exciting because it's from, this is from last week. This is that same pilot site and we went to go check up on it. And uh, that coral in the front there, I'm gonna flip back and forth between these sides. That coral in the front there is that same coral in the front in this picture. Um, so you can see that it barely even looks like a pyramid anymore, which is like really exciting to see. Um, it's really continued to grow. It's gotten much more of that lumpy natural shape. And it's just really excited to see the success at this site. So, so far, um, there's not a lot of modules at this site, but so far all of them have uh, had 100% survival and they've been doing really well at this site. And we've been able to expand at a few, a few other sites um, since this one. So, but I'll show you all just a few quick pictures of, this is that same coral that we just saw. So this was all planted in 2017. And this picture on the left is after one month. Uh, you can kind of still see the bumps where the original microfragments were. After nine months, you can really see that it started growing down onto the bottom and it started to get more lumpy. So just as a reminder, after the coral is out into the wild, then they go back to that one to two centimeter growth rate. Um, so you're not gonna see it you know, explode in growth. And then this is that same coral two and a half years after it's been outplanted. Um, so it still looks a little bit like a pyramid, but it's, it's definitely not gonna look like a pyramid or it's not gonna look like a pyramid for much too much longer. All right, so um, I'll dive into a little bit more about uh, a question we often get is how we select our outplant sites. So first we need to establish our need for restoring a site and choosing the module, where the modules are actually gonna go. So that's what this image is, is we do a survey, what corals are there, um, what does the site look like and why does it need to be restored? We had some fun last year um, when the pandemic started and we had already planned to be outplanting a bunch of coral. So um, we got a lot of masts and we got a bigger boat um, to keep six feet apart. 
so, but we were still able to outplant a lot of our coral modules at another site off the south shore of Oahu. And this is outplanting some of those modules. So we actually were on a uh, diving uh, freeze for a little while because of COVID. So we had um, some commercial divers come and help us outplant the coral. So we clean the substrate where the coral is. And even though it's pretty heavy on concrete, we secure it with epoxy, marine safe epoxy onto the bottom. And then we document and follow up. So here's um, Norton uh, taking some pictures of some of our recently outplanted coral modules at that site. A few more pictures. And then also at that site, we had our first one meter coral outplanting. So I've been talking about how we have 42, these 42 centimeter modules. Um, well, we wanted to go bigger. So because uh, bigger is better. And we, again, are trying to address that um, size refuge. So the bigger the size, the lower chance of mortality and the more um, services the coral provides. So I'll show you a few pictures of, this is our one meter coral outplanting, which is the first known one meter size coral outplanting that's been grown in a nursery that we know of in the world. So that was really exciting and we were able to do that last summer. And so we did that by making, um, one meter of concrete is pretty heavy and I don't wanna carry that all by myself. So what we did is we split it up into four pieces. And uh, as you can see in that picture and these ones down here, so we did the same thing, microfragment corals. And once it's fully covered, it's equivalent to about 50 to 100 years of growth that we're able to do in, again, just a year. So an even bigger jump in time. And so this is the, the four pieces of the module. This is in one of our tanks when it's almost fully grown. And what we do is we don't assemble it in, at the nursery and then bring it to the field. We actually assemble it in the field. So we have our four pieces and we put them together in the field. We secure them with epoxy. And then soon enough, um, soon enough, they grow over just that thin line and they become one big colony, one one meter colony. So that's what that looked like, um, putting all these pieces together. You can see it kind of looks like a diamond shape and we're able to line up all those four pieces. And all those pieces are again, the same genotype and so they're able to fuse back together over that line of epoxy between the pieces. So here's a picture of that same coral uh, after it's been all glued together. You can see how all the four pieces fit together. And another photo here, you can see a little bit of the epoxy line between the pieces. And then just a few more things we're gonna talk about. Uh, we'll get to your rare coral question for the audience member who asked that. So um, we have a rare coral arc here. And what that is, is essentially it's a seed bank for rare species. So Hawaii has really high endemism. So that means if it's endemic, it means it's found nowhere else. It's found only in Hawaii. And one of those species is called Paredes duodeni. And we collected three pieces pieces of this species <laughs> in 2015. And uh, later on in that year, those wild colonies died in the summer due to um, a really severe bleaching event. And when we went back later to try and find those original colonies, we couldn't find any living colonies. We asked around, um, we couldn't find any colonies that were in that, the bay that it was in. So we actually had those colonies and they did really well for us. So we we're able to grow them onto these little uh, mini modules. And in 2019, we were actually able to reintroduce these rare endemic species back into Kaneohe Bay on Oahu. Um, and we did that as part of Coral Palooza, which is a coral outplanting event run by the Coral Restoration Foundation. And you can see in that upper photo, it's a more recent photo and it's started to finger out, which is its more natural growth form. So it's been really, really exciting to see these doing well. Um, last summer was pretty hot too, but um, they got a little bit pale, but they quickly recovered and they've been growing really well since. So our rare Hawaiian coral arc, um, we, there's about 61 species of Hawaiian corals at the nursery and about 50 species are either uh, uncommon 
uncommon endemic or rare species. And so what we want to do is keep just little pieces of specimens of these species as essentially a living seed bank for coral. Um, so in case anything happens to those wild populations, like what happened to the Paredes duodeni, we have a backup. That coral isn't completely gone. It's not, um, there. we can't re replace it anywhere. There's no replacement pool for these species. There, some, some of these are found in only one bay or from one island. So we don't wanna lose them. And we also partner with Maui Ocean Center. So they have a sister, a rare Hawaiian coral arc and we trade specimens and techniques and notes. Um, so they also have a lot of rare Hawaiian corals at their facility. And they have really great um, staff professional aquarists who know how to take care of rare Hawaiian corals. So um, if we think about the 2018 eruption and Kapoho tide pools, those tide pools look like this previously until um, they were completely run over with lava and they no longer exist, unfortunately. And they had these beautiful, beautiful corals in them so we were actually able to collect a few, of the, a few pieces of these corals before the eruption event. And we actually still have those corals at our nursery. And so um, those corals are essentially the only corals left from these tide pools. And so um, last thing is we've been talking about massive corals and uh, what about branching corals? Hawaii doesn't have a lot, but they have a few. One of them is called lace coral or Pacillopora damocornis. And what's really cool about this coral is it produces, um, this picture on the right, it produces little planula. So these are coral babies, coral larvae, and it produces um, asexual ones. So we can't, this is a branching coral, we can't cut it up and put it on a module. It's not going to work. Um, and so what we do instead is collect these planula and we're able to collect them from one colony and force them to settle and turn into a little polyp um, onto a small tile. And we're able to uh, fast grow that tile and make them grow fast. And then when they touch, they fuse, the branches will fuse back together. So it's just another way of um, fast growing a branching species. We're also working on antler coral, which is uh, also called Pacillopora edui or Pacillopora grandis. And this is the Hawaii's largest branching coral. And if you ever go diving, you want to look in between the branches of these coral colonies because you're going to find um, you're going to find crabs, you're going to find fish. There's a lot of organisms that call these corals home. So we wanted to figure out a way to fast grow these as well, and they don't produce the planula like the other branching coral. So we actually had a, a summer intern from UH who's an engineering student, and he came up with this model of uh, we've been kind of calling it a cat tree. Uh, of a way that we could create a concrete module that would have formed a base for this coral to branch off of. And that's kind of um, a little bit further model of what we made. And we we're hoping that this would form the branches and the coral would branch off from this um, foundation. So we were able to microfragment the EDUI, put it on our concrete, casted concrete uh, model of the cat tree. And the only thing we had was our lights are downwelling. So they're only from one direction. And so the branches made shade. So what we did is we drew inspiration from those sick dog collars that you have for your dog so it doesn't bite on its leg. And we made essentially a cone for a coral, but we lined it with reflective mylar on the inside to reflect that light back up. And it actually, um, it was kind of a crazy idea, but it worked really well. So this is what that same coral looks like. Um, it fully covered the coral and you can see that there's all those little nubs are the beginning of branches. So this was really, really exciting to see, um, especially with this like weird technique that we used. But we're hoping that each of those little nubs will then branch off and become its own branch. Um, so a few things of what's next at the nursery. We're working on expanding our planula collection, um, fast growing more rare species. So we did that one that I talked about and we're actually growing another species that's endemic um, in Kaneohe Bay, which is Montebro dilatata. Um, we're also, we've done the one meter and we wanna go even bigger. So we want to look at two meter corals. 
And also we've done the, the antler corals about one foot and we wanna go two feet or more for those. So we just wanna, um, bigger is better. So we wanna keep continuing to scale up. All right, so just to wrap up, um, there's a lot of people that have been involved in working at the coral nursery. Um, I've been with the coral nursery for only two years and uh, there's been a lot of the staff who has really helped me and come up with new ideas for new projects and continuing to move the nursery forward, as well as our interns, researchers, um, and partners. And finally, my last closing slide um, it's just to emphasize how unique Hawaii is and how our reefs are really vulnerable to um, damages and reef loss. Um, since our reefs are so close to shore, they're so easily impacted by um, anthropogenic activities of people doing stuff on the aina and that affects our corals. So the state is uh, really actively working on trying to come up with new ways for coral restoration and so that uh, this is a priority, like we need to do something for our reefs now. If we don't start now, then it's uh, soon it's going to be too late. And it's a cute turtle. <laughs> if you have any um, questions, I think Darla's going to facilitate in a minute. And this is my contact information as well as David Gulko. He is our nursery uh, director. And mahalo, uh, thank you so much for uh, letting me share about the coral nursery. Great. Well, thank you so much, Christina. That was so interesting. And we do have a few questions. Some of them were answered as, as you went along, but uh, there, there are a couple of, of interesting things. Donna Brown asked, what are you cultivating to feed the corals? Oh, hi, Donna. Um, so we have uh, two main ways of feeding our corals. So I mentioned we have live foods and that's mostly we have phytoplankton, we have two different species of phytoplankton, and we also have zooplankton, so cocoa pods. But uh, the main diet we feed our corals is actually frozen food, and it's fish food. So we feed mysis shrimp, um, artemia, uh, spirulina artemia, as well as a few other supplemental foods that we actually um, buy that are supplied through the commercial aquarium trade. I know you said you had a five-star hotel for the corals, so it sounds like they're getting the five-star diet as well. Yes. <laughs> so Caitlin Allen asked, is there a need for planting corals on other islands? Uh, I think, you know, we heard about a lot of Oahu activities. Is, is there plans to do these activities elsewhere? Um, yes, currently we haven't done outer island um, outplantings. Uh, we do work with Maui Ocean Center and they have um, they have a rare coral arc and they've also started working on microfragmenting corals. And they actually have a lot of experience with uh, transplanting corals, not using wet concrete. <laughs> um, and so we're hoping in the future that we'll be able to um, either work with other partners or, or expand and be able to uh, work more heavily on other islands as well, not just Oahu. Okay, I, I'm gonna throw in a question of my own, kind of along mm -hmm. the same line. So, you know, what what's the reality or practicality of uh, growing land-based corals and having them be effective for shoreline protection? since we have you know, sea level rise and other environmental impacts that are increasing? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Darla. Um, so really that's why we have a really big emphasis on scaling up and going bigger because um, those bigger corals provide more of those services and more of those functions, especially in areas that um, you know, are really vulnerable and really need it. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have, you know, more corals, the better, essentially. And um, now that we've been able to really kind of prove our concept with our 42 centimeters and our one meters, and that's why we wanna go really big to really have um, an impact on those or really provide more of those services and functions. Okay. Uh, Sherry Curry wanted to ask, how old are your oldest corals that you have outplanted? Probably um, the coral nursery is pretty young and um, 
It's probably that coral that I was talking about as an example that was outplanted in 2017. Okay. Um, Elizabeth Yanell wanted to kind of pose, maybe this might be a question or an idea. Um, is it worth having a rare coral arc on each of the main islands? Can you talk about that? I think the main thing with the rare coral arc or the limiting factor would be um, a facility that can hold the rare corals. Um, so as I mentioned before, corals are protected, especially and rare corals are, you know, um, rare. And uh, just to have, you would need permitting and such to keep them. But also what's really important is Hawaiian corals are so unique. You really need people who know how to take care of Hawaiian corals. Um, so you need a, a facility, a biosecure facility uh, where you can keep the corals, keep them alive, uh, grow them if you're trying to do restoration, and most importantly, have uh, the, the professional staff needed that will be able to take care of them, because some of them are, are really finicky. <laughs> right, right. So that's why we work with Maui Ocean Center, since they, um, they have a really great facility, and um, they have professional staff who have been working with Hawaiian corals for decades. Right. You know, I was going to say, you explained it so well, you almost made it sound easy. And I know it's <laughs> a very difficult process. Um, Andrew Fox asked, do you try and select for coral that resists bleaching and or stony coral tissue loss disease? So luckily, um, stony coral tissue loss disease is not really pro, uh, it's not in Hawaii. It's, it's not an issue that we have to address, thank mm -hmm. goodness. Um, but people in Florida are uh, really, um, really struggling with uh, trying to combat that disease in, in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, that's, that's not an issue. Um, but for other corals, we're not genetically testing them. What we want to do is we don't want to make a, a super coral or like a weedy coral that will just take over. We want to preserve the biodiversity of our coral species. So um, we don't test them, but the most since most of our corals come from harbors, they're kind of, I don't want to say selected, but almost selected and they're able to survive in, in um, non-ideal conditions. Yep, I, I understand that. And this is kind of a related question. And I did hear you say that, that you don't test them. But just from your background, do you know, do Hawaiian corals suffer from any disease? That, that was a question from Nancy Caruso. Um, yeah, um, thank you, Nancy. There are diseases in Hawaii that do affect corals. Um, luckily, they're just not as prevalent as they are in um, other areas of the world. So there, there are diseases. It's definitely has not been um, an issue for us at the nursery. Okay. But they so, do exist. <laughs> okay. Um, so Tyler Bauer has a two-part question. Is there any damage done to the coral when they're cut up or is it pretty much negated once the pieces grow and merge back together? And part two is when dealing with rare coral or any coral really, are there any concerns about lack of genetic diversity similar to animals? Hmm. Hi, Tyler, great questions. Um, so when we cut the coral, the, the blade that we use is a, uh, it's a, a diamond blade on a bandsaw. And so it does, when you, whenever you cut something, you are, you know, damaging essentially that little strip, but um, it's essentially negated by when it, when it grows back together, it's maybe, you know, a few polyps or something, depending on the species. Mostly it's more of handling because you don't want to smush them with your hands. Um, you don't want to damage the tissue. So it's mostly just handling them carefully by the sides and not you know, by the top that is actually where most of the damage comes in. They're able to recover pretty easily from being cut. And then the second question was genetic diversity about rare corals. Uh, or so, any corals. Yeah. Or corals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why we have, um, we're not just doing one species. We're not just doing one genotype. We have um, as many genotypes as we can, essentially, to try and preserve that biodiversity, that mm -hmm. genetic biodiversity. 
Okay, um, so Mark Dekos had another question. This kind of might be along the lines of, of my question that I asked. Uh, he says, uh, first of all, very cool stuff. Uh, and you- <laughs> Thanks, Mark. You meant, yeah, <laughs> coming, coming from Mark, that's a high compliment. <laughs> uh, you mentioned mitigation requirements for coral impacts. Other than minimizing impacts to coral during dredging, shoreline revetment, species, beach nourishment, et cetera, using silt nets or shoreline booms. Is there any offsetting of the impacts? And if so, do you have examples? Um, of impacts from those events or other events? Um, of, I, I believe he's asking uh, examples of ways to offset impacts. Oh, I see. Um, well, I'll talk about our one of our current projects is for a planned impact of the construction of a new container terminal at Honolulu Harbor is mm -hmm. that there was a bunch of coral growing there. And so um, essentially what our job was, was to remove the coral that was there, bring that back to our nursery, grow those coral out um, to those large colony modules, and then outplant them onto a nearby uh, damaged reef area. So mm -hmm. we outplanted them just a little ways out from where the harbor is onto a natural reef area that had been damaged by a ship grounding. Mm -hmm. So that's our current project that we're working on. Okay, so there's a direct correlation there. Not, so thank you very mm -hmm. much. And I, I think we're gonna have to let that be the last question. Um, and I just really so appreciate you you being here. I, I know I learned a lot. I hope everyone else did too. So thank you very much, Christina. Yeah, mahalo Darla and everyone else on the Maui Nui Resource Council. Thank you for inviting me and letting me share. And we wish you and your team so much success in, in your work to grow now plant corals to help restore our dwindling coral reefs. It's such important work. I also wanted to thank our audience for attending this Know Your Ocean Speaker Series hosted by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, a nonprofit organization celebrating 14 years of working for clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and abundant native fish for the islands of Maui Nui. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's projects include ocean water quality monitoring along Maui's leeward shores, visitor education programs, the Oast Oyster Bioremediation Project to improve ocean water quality in Ma'alaya Bay, efforts to reduce sediment runoff from the Po'okea watershed into Ma'alaya Bay, a Limu isotope study, and a new pesticide education project to encourage Maui landscapers, homeowners, and property owners to switch away from synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides that are harmful to coral reefs. This work is made possible with the support of people like you. Please donate to Maui Nui Marine Resource Council at MauiReefs.org. When you do, you can choose from some great swag, uh, including um, some of the things that I'm, I'm looking to see if there's a, a picture on the screen. They're, they really do have some nice things. Uh, and our next Know Your Ocean Speaker Series event will take place on Wednesday, May 12th at 5.30 on Zoom. Our speaker is David Cohen, manager of the Sea Urchin Hatchery on Oahu, operated by the Division of Aquatic Resources. So Christina, I think one of your partners over there, uh, considered one of the most effective marine invasive species control projects implemented in Hawaii. The hatchery has produced more than 600,000 sea urchins which have been used to treat more than 227 acres of reef in Kaneohe Bay on Oahu. The sea urchins uh, munch and mow down the seaweed like goats in a grass field. <laughs> Come and join us on May 12th to learn more about this innovative project. And to get news about all of our upcoming events, Please sign up for Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's free monthly e-newsletter, Reef and Brief, at MauiReefs.org. You can view the presentation and share it on Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's Facebook page. 
at facebook.com slash MNMRC, and you can view all past presentations at Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's YouTube page at Maui Reefs. Please let your friends know that they can listen to this presentation um, this Sunday on the radio uh, at 9 a.m. or a shortened version of this presentation on all uh, HYA media stations. And thank you to all of the businesses and organizations that sponsor Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Thank you again for joining us tonight on this eve of Earth Day. Please go out and do something great to make a difference for the environment tomorrow and celebrate Earth Day. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Christina. And good night, everyone.